Let us pray. August 2000, I sat down for a one-on-one -on -one interview with Lawrence Ferlinghetti at Tosca Cafe, and we talked all about how and his career, and um, so the excerpts that you hear in this documentary are from that conversation. I'd like to really, you know, go start at the beginning and with when you met Alan, did, you know, I heard that he strolled into City Lights, like, you know, and it's just somebody's son's imagination added the stroll. <laughs> okay. Well, he lived in the neighborhood, didn't he? I mean, he was at uh, 1010 Montgomery. Oh, that was later. Uh, okay. So let me begin at the beginning. I was in, in France on the GI Bills, uh, getting a doctorate at the Sorbonne, and I didn't know any American poets. I was living in a French family, doing a thesis in French, and, uh, and uh, when they were in the beats, were at Columbia University in New York and on, on uh, Times Square and hitchhiking around the country, I was doing that in France. I didn't know. I wasn't a member of the original beat group. I got associated with them by publishing. Can you hear us? Oh, certainly, yes. You were slightly older than them. Yeah, except Burroughs was much older. Right. Than Burroughs. Yeah, I was seven years older than Ginsburg. About the same, five or six years older than Kerouac. But anyway, so I came to San Francisco and started City Lights with Peter Dean Martin in uh, June 53. And naturally, I started meeting poets because poets naturally congregate in bookstores. And, uh, just a couple of years after we got started that Alan Ginsberg came through. I think he'd been in Mexico. Came up from Mexico and uh, he hadn't met, yes, he had met Peter Orlovsky by then who became his steady boyfriend. That's right. So he'd been in San Francisco, I don't know, a few weeks or months before he came around to City Lights. And this is, must have been in '55, uh, right? Now some books say August '55. I know I went to his journals, and he moved to the area in like he stayed with the Cassidys over in San Jose in like June '54, and then Carolyn Cassidy kicked him out in August '54. At which point? At, what, at which point he moved? to across from City Lights. He moved across from City Lights yeah, at well, that point. Now, did, did you see him in the, in the neighborhood at, 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 at any point? No, I, mean, I never saw him until he came into the bookstore. And at that point, I was living on Potrero Hill. I, I was married, leading a bourgeois life. Right. And uh, I uh, didn't stay down in North Beach at night much. So I didn't meet him until he came to the store with his manuscript. Now, your own background. Any visit to Lawrence Ferlinghetti's North Beach has to start at 261 Columbus Avenue at City Lights Books, which is the bookstore he founded in 53, and then it became City Lights Publishers in uh, 1955, and founded by Peter D. Martin and Berlin Getty. Peter D. Martin being the son of a famous celebrated anarchist who got murdered, and Berlin Getty, the self described son of a mafioso. This is where it began and this is where it remains today. 
from this vantage point, you can eyeball major iconic uh, places of the Beat era, like Vesuvio, which is right across from City Lights, as you can see, um, where Allen Ginsberg and Dylan Thomas and other poets of the era used to drink and get drunk. This is the residence listed in the 1955 and 56 San Francisco telephone books um, for, uh, this is the place for Lawrence Ferlinghetti. When Allen Ginsberg arrived in San Francisco from New York in August 1954, he landed at this sort of flea bag hotel called, called the Marconi Hotel, which is right across, as you can see, from uh, City Lights Books. Um, and, but he didn't stay there for long. However, he did write um, and on one of his first nights at the Marconi, back alone in a hotel, and once again, the great battle for survival is what he wrote, according to uh, a book by Michael Schumacher. But he didn't stay long, and he soon moved a few blocks east to Montgomery Street. Next year, the next year in 1955, Ginsburg, 29 years old, settled a few blocks east of the Marconi um, at 1010 Montgomery Street. Um, he was, uh, this is the place um, on the first floor, you can see right there, facing Montgomery on the left side, is where he began writing the first drafts of Powell. And um, he, he actually wrote in his journal I sat idly at my desk a few blocks from City Lights Literary Paperback Bookshop. I had a secondhand typewriter, some cheap scratch paper. I began typing, not with the idea of writing a formal poem, but stating my imaginative sympathies. Anyway, um, this is the place where the poem began. Um, All right, so how did the whole Howl trial happen anyway? All right, like this. City Lights, looking to save a buck, used a discount printer in the UK called Villiers for the How Print Run. Now, Villiers had previously been busted for obscenity for earlier publications, so customs officials started flagging uh, virtually all Villiers exports. Uh, one of them was, you guessed it, a uh, How which they figured must be somehow obscene owing to its associ association with Villiers. <laughs> Though charges were soon dropped, uh, the customs action brought the book to the attention of the local cops in San Francisco, whose vice squad promptly busted Lawrence Ferlinghetti and his store clerk Shigamarao for selling obscene material. Subsequent trial um, acquitted Ferlinghetti and City Lights and created such publicity that it turned Howl into a big hit. Uh, Very impressive. I don't know, my father was an auctioneer. He, he uh, got me a small time mafioso. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> it must have been aired in some of his. Were you surprised with the, uh, I mean, do you think that uh, the trial would have gone differently had Ginsburg been in town? Well, no, he wasn't arrested. He wasn't indicted. No, certainly not. It was only you and, and, and Shig for a while, or Shig Morale, yeah. if I'm pronouncing that right. But, but if Ginsburg had been around, he would have been called as a witness, and it, there would have been a lot more media hoopla. And what, what do you think? Well, no, you there wouldn't, because he wasn't known. That's right. He was totally unknown. Was the I don't think uh, I forget where he was. He was either on a freighter in Alaska or he was in Tangier. I forget where he was. Morocco. He was. He wrote to you from Morocco saying, "This looks like trouble. This is worse than the customs action. You know, the local cop thing that happened." And and uh, 
you you know you could you know and he was really alarmed. If, do you remember that? That uh, I have the. Yeah, exact I remember part. that letter. I think it's in the Ann Charter's selected letter. It is. Yes. Yeah. It is. And and um, but but you you know did you think that maybe it was a boon? It was a help because you um, you were getting all this you know you were getting publicity or, or were you alarmed? Were were you? Oh no, I was really happy with the whole thing. She was too. By the way, if you, if you know, you read Cottage, you realize how you know, he was attached to his mother. He was, you know, Naomi was lobotomized about a month or two before Hal was written. Yeah. Do you think that, do you think that that was one of the causes, you know, I mean, it probably, it, Hal is such an eruption. a hole in his glass. Oh. I you swallowed that in a hurry. Ah, okay. <laughs> Just a drop. That's enough, thanks. But, you know... So I sent Alan a Western Union telegram that night saying, uh, I greet you at the beginning of a great career. When do we get the manuscript? You know where the first sentence came from? Oh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. You're right. So, yes. When he first read Leaves the Grass, he sent a note to Whitman. So that's, uh, and Alan never mentioned that. The only way that got known is that the, I started telling reporters about it years later. Another thing Alan never told anybody, was, and I don't know, I haven't really studied the collected, the annotated howl, but uh, and Alan says he has no memory of it, but I distinctly remember there was a, a fifth part of howl that I persuaded him to leave out. There was a whole page, single space typewritten page, huh. and it didn't go with the rest of the poem, and I persuaded him to leave it out. I mean, no one had ever heard anything like that before. Was there a buzz? No, that was a, that's the thing about with a great poet or a great poem, when you hear it for the first time, you say, I never heard anything like that. I never heard, I never saw the world like that before. I mean, there, it's, it's a great world view, right from the... There you go. Is that how you felt when you yeah. got Yeah, I mean, I said I never, never uh, saw reality like this before. I mean, that's what you say when you pick up Whitman for the first time, for instance. Right. And uh, so uh, I took uh, after that. But so it was very academic poetry scene before how and how to sort of keep the sides out of everything the way. Uh, Rock and roll revolution started in the 60s. Cool jazz just disappeared. Yes, <laughs> right. That's right. And uh, so when he gave me the manuscript, I first said, well, we don't have any money right now, but soon. And uh, then the Howl reading was at the Sixth Gallery was like two nights later. Oh, okay. So that's October. That would place it in October. Well, I don't know if it was two nights later, but it seemed to me from now, looking down through the wrong end of the telescope, it was very soon after I first saw the manuscript, they had this reading at the six. Well, well let's... Um, let's uh, now, the Sixth Gallery thing, Allen Ginsberg was, was organizing it, and did he approach you? I mean... He probably wanted you to read, didn't he? I mean, because no. of the Gone World, you know, had already come out. You were I know, but I wasn't one of his gang. I wasn't one of his group at all. I was sort of considered me like a square uh, bookshop owner. Really? I mean, in, in Kerouac's... Uh, that everybody was going over to this Friday night reading. It was, it was this, this, you know, Ginsburg was going to do the first public reading of how, and um, you invited, you and your wife invited Kerouac and Ginsburg uh, to drive over in your car. Yeah, we had an old Austin. Oh, an old Austin? My first car. Okay. My first car, yeah, we only bought second hand. It was a little tiny car, and there were three or, maybe three or four boats jammed in the back. Huh. That's a lot of, I mean, in Austin, Austin well, Martin. maybe there was three of them in there, Kerouac and Ginsburg and Peter Olofsky. Yeah. That's all I remember. 
Well, I'm trying to picture it. So they they came in from Berkeley, like uh, yeah, yeah, like they must have taken the Bart or some Kerouac and Ginsburg. There was no Bart then. There was no Bart, okay. But they were living like on Milby Art. There was only one level on the Bay Bridge. There were trains on the other level. Okay, on the Bart on the Bay Bridge. They probably came over on the, on the train. On the train, and they met you at like City Lights. Yeah. yeah. You got into I the think so. I was living in Potrero Hill. I mean, oh, that's right. You were there. Maybe I picked them up somewhere. On he was living on Golf Street. Maybe I don't remember. Nah. Okay. We lived at 1407 Golf Street. I think that was the number for a long time. He did. According to his journals, Ginsburg's journals, he was at uh, he was at Nobia Street at this point. Oh, that was in Berkeley in the cottage. Cottage, yeah. He did that poem, you know, yeah. reality sandwiches, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but yeah, Kerouac was like staying with him just for for the weekend or the, not the weekend. Yeah, see, Kerouac never really lived here except for a short period where he worked on the Southern Pacific as a brakeman. He lived in a hotel down by the old Southern Pacific Railroad Station, which is near the uh, ballpark, the new ballpark. Okay. The old, the old Southern Pacific Station was on Third Street there. Just okay. Third and Townsend. Okay. <laughs> and, and Kerouac, what kind of guy was he, by the way? I mean, you know, in terms of to meet him for the first time. Uh, you know, was the kid Alan was always trying to make him say he was he was gay, but I thought that was really absurd. He was one of the biggest women chasers I ever met. Oh, really? That's interesting. He was built like a French, uh, like a French Canuck uh, lumberjack. <laughs> yeah, he, he played football at, uh, in Lowell, I like guess. Yeah. But he's, a, he's another star. Uh, I didn't get to know him very well. I, I ended up knowing Alan much better than him. Right? Yeah. So, by the respectability of how today, I mean, it's taught in all the universities that rejected Ginsburg, you know. Yeah. Are you surprised? Well, uh, no, because I think it happened because it be, the beat message uh, became the only rebellion around. And it's still the same today. I mean, in fact, when at the time of the life of uh, how trial Life magazine published a big story on the trial, and the headline was the only rebellion around, which is still the case today. And also, what with the, with the with dot commies and the whole uh, computer consciousness and the, and the uh, corporate monoculture consciousness that's taken over the whole country and the world, and television consciousness. The, the, the beat message is needed more than ever. 